which we're trying to preach, and that's uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 1 Samuel chapter 1. In your devotional time, please, please read the whole uh, chapter. Amen. We're just going to be reading verses 1 through 7. Verses 1 through 7. Amen. And they read like this. Now there was a certain man in Ramathim of Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tahu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite, might, and he had two wives. The name was, one was Hannah, the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from the city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival and her enemy also provoked her, harassed her, messed with her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Amen. Do me a favor and find a, find a few people around you and just simply say these words. Hannah prayed. Come on, find some folks. Hannah prayed. Hannah prayed. Amen. You, you may be seated. Oh, God, would you allow your word to be preached clearly and absolutely so that your people might be blessed? We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, which is in this place. We thank you for his presence. Bless us now to worship you in preaching. We thank you for this word. So, Lord, your Gloria and the people of God said amen, amen. and praise God. Amen. There is a blessing in burdens. There is a blessing in burdens. There is a blessing in being broken. There is a blessing in having a drive, a passion, a need, something on the inside that you cannot put to sleep. There is a blessing in burdens. The story is told of two travelers. They were walking on a cold winter's day. As they were walking, unexpectedly, there came a blizzard. This wasn't a small blizzard, but it was a powerful, large blizzard. The snow was blowing seemingly in every direction. They could not even see their hands. As they were walking Hodari on this journey, something happened. One of them stumbled into a man who had fallen in the snow and was obviously dying. These two travelers now had a choice. They could leave the man who was in the snow. He would die there, but he was heavy. He was a burden. If they chose to carry him, he might even cause them to die from exhaustion. They had a choice. What should we do? One of the men reasoned. He said, my friend, you can carry him if you want to, but I'm not going to give up my life trying to save him. I'm going to go on. I've got to move on. I can't give up for him. And so one man went on. The other man decided, I'm going to do my best. I might risk my life. It might take my all. This might even end my life. But I can't pass this man in the snow and leave him here. One man 
bent down, placed the weight on his back, and carried another man in the blizzard for almost another two miles. He went on. He could barely make it. His legs were hurting. There was pain throughout his body. He was wondering how he would move further, how he could go on. But with each step, he just kept pushing and stepping until finally he kicked something. He kicked something, and in kicking something, he stumbled and fell. And there he noticed the man who had went in front of him had frozen to death. The cold froze him. The cold made him die in the spot. He immediately asked the question, well, why didn't I freeze to death? I'm in the same snow. I don't understand. Why didn't I freeze to death? Why is he dead and I'm living? And at that, he picked up the burden on his back and continued on his trek. And then as he put the man on his back, who was a burden on his back, it came to mind the only difference between the man who froze to death and the man who kept on trekking is he was carrying a burden. Sometimes the difference in your life is the burden in your bosom. Sometimes the difference in your life is some drive God has put in your soul. I know I'm telling the truth because a lot of people study show in retirement. I'm not saying don't retire, but when you do just work for the church. Amen. Uh, a lot of people who reach. Amen. Amen. You got to laugh sometimes. Uh, a lot of people in retirement, they don't find some burden. They don't find some passion. They don't find some reason to get up and go on. And oftentimes it will shorten their lifespan. You ought to check out the studies. God sometimes will put a burden in your life because he wants to bless you. He wants to drive you. He wants to give you a passion. And I know you know this text. This is a popular text and it's popular because this is a sister who we all can relate to. This is a sister who was burdened. This was a sister who had a passion. This was a sister who had something on the inside that she could not put to sleep. And because of that, this sister decided to pray. She would cry out to the Lord praying and her prayer was so powerful. Her prayer was so deep. Her prayer was so sincere that she didn't have to write out a fasting plan. She didn't have to be pushed by someone to fast, but she just woke up and said, I'm not eating until God bless me. God, I refuse to let you go. God, I really need this and I'm not eating. I, I, I'm just focused on you, God, unless you give me what I'm asking for, unless you give me my child, I'm not eating. If you read the text, it goes on to explain that her husband and tradition or the culture of celebration had to compel her to eat because she would not eat unless the Lord answered her prayer. And the Bible goes on to say year after year, she really had something that drove her to pray. Can I show you what drove her to pray first? The first thing that drove her to pray was her agony. Would you say agony? Yeah, an agony is something on the inside, often propelled by something on the outside. Culture said she had to have a child to be valuable. Back then, the culture said, if you didn't have, if you were a woman and you didn't have a child, then you weren't significant. They didn't have great women like uh, uh, like uh, Oprah Winfrey and other women who didn't have children. They didn't know you could contribute in so many other ways. Well, so she decided, I really want a child. And she had this agony that just kept pushing her, propelling her, and compelling her so much so her husband pleaded with her he said baby don't I treat you right baby didn't I buy you a mink and aren't you driving a nice camel I'm not, aren't I treating you well I'm faithful to you and your sister wife I treat you real good why aren't you happy with just me and she said I love you boo but I'm asking God for a baby and I'm not just asking God for a baby but I'm asking God for a baby boy she had an agony and I know there's somebody in here your agony may not be for a child but the Literally, there's someone seated next to you. There's someone seated in front of you, maybe behind you, and they have an agony. There's something on the inside that they can't let go. There's something they see that they believe in. It may be not for a child, but it may be for a child who's gone astray. It may not be for their children, but it may be for children in the education system. It, it, it may not be for children in the education system. It might be for their church Shiloh. They see a great future. They see even better things in the past. They see blessings beyond blessings. They know that God has something in store. There's an agony on the inside. I hope you've got a little bit of agony. I hope you have something stirring you. I hope you have something driving you. I hope you have something propelling you. I hope you have something pushing you. I, I hope you're not just passive. I, I hope you're not apathetic. Doesn't that sound bad? Apathetic, pathetic, apathetic. But I hope you have something on the inside that pushes you for something bigger, that pushes you for something better, that pushes you for a difference. 
that pushes you for change. Think about Martin Luther King. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate his birthday. Uh, Martin Luther King had a passion. He, he wasn't okay with society the way it was. He felt that society needed to change. He had this passion that he called his dream. Everywhere he went, he would tell the same story about his dream. And in fact, he was preaching one day. It was one of his biggest speeching engagements. He was on the monument, the national monument in Washington, D.C. And his friend there, Mahalia Jackson, was with him. He had written this powerful new word to share with the people. He was sharing it eloquently. He was telling and explaining all these good things. But his friend, Mahalia Jackson, interrupted him from the crowd. She was behind him because she had just sung. And she said, tell him your dream. And he continued with the speech he read. Tell him your dream. And he continued with the speech. But finally she said, tell him your dream. And he shifted gears. And he said, I have a dream. And he went into his dream. And it was so powerful. It was so passionate because it came from the bottom of his soul. I hope you have something in the bottom of your soul. I hope you have something deep down in your soul. You can't sleep it off. You can't drink it off. You can't smoke it off. You can't play it off. You can't buy it off. You can't sex it off because it's a passion, an agony in your soul. First, she had an agony. And if this one doesn't get you, if agony doesn't get you, she had an enemy. Mm, yeah, let the church say enemy. If you don't have an agony, agony, I pray that God will give you an enemy. Amen. Somebody who will cause you to be your best and to do your best. Somebody who will cause you to go above and beyond what you thought you could do, what you did last year. Somebody that will make you be your very best every day. Heard the story of a sister. Uh, she had a neighbor and the neighbor was absolutely fine. No, don't be offended. The neighbor was absolutely fine. They were the same age, but the neighbor looked real good. <clears throat> real good. I mean, she was fine. And every day the neighbor would work out in her tights and her wonderful workout clothes. And, and finally, finally, uh, the, the wife who was the neighbor to this fine woman, she got a little concerned. She said, my husband is going to see her and my husband is going to start looking at her. And so finally this wife decided, I'm going to start working out too. Amen. I'm a, amen. Amen. I'll just move on. Every now and then, it's okay to have an enemy because an enemy will help you become more than you are because an enemy will help you to do your best because an enemy will help you not to be lazy because an enemy will make you wake up in the middle of the night and say, I can't let him fire me because I don't deserve to be fired. An enemy will make you creative, will make you have an ingenuity, will make you have sincerity, will make you have a depth that will push you further. And can I tell you, I prayed it, if I wasn't playing, but the truth is you do have an enemy and he's the devil and he comes to steal, kill and destroy. So whether you know it or not, that voice that talks to you, that voice that discourages you is you and tell you what you can't do, where you won't go and what won't happen. That's the enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the enemy. It's not a fight you're having with your friend in church or your cousin them or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your spouse. That's the enemy. You do have an enemy, but let me move on. She prayed because she had an agony and she had an enemy. And I want to let you know that you too ought to have an agony and you too have an enemy. But look, I want us now to look at not, not just the fact that she prayed, but how this prayer, what this prayer really was, because this was a passionate prayer and we can see it in the text. First, we see that this was a passionate prayer because it was earnest. Another word, sincere. Another word, genuine. Another word, real. She had a real prayer. She didn't just pray the rope prayers. I have nothing against the rope prayers. Oh man, I remember growing up, we had this deacon. I never really understood what he was praying. He was talking about, I pray, I, I thank God that my last night bed wasn't my Okay, you're Baptist too. Wasn't my cooling board. I never really understood what that meant. But, but it seemed to be the same prayer over and over again. And I'm not against that. But there should be something in your heart that comes with tears. There should be something in your heart that is so deep down in, it's troubling. You, you, you just don't say it like you're calm. You, you can barely articulate it without tears coming to your eyes because it's earnest. You ought to have an earnest prayer. Let me give you an example of earnest. It's a true story of a man in New York. Uh, he's gone around for the past 20 years looking for coins. He's made it his practice and recently he found about $2,000 in coins. He always looks around for coins. He says, now that people have cell phones, it's much easier to find coins on the ground because nobody really is paying attention to the ground. He finds all these coins and he keeps them. You see, he has a deep concern to find coins. Now, you may not be looking for coins, but the Bible has an example of looking for coins. It also has an example of looking for sheep. And then it has an example of looking for one man looking for his children. You see, what is trying to paint a picture of 
of is an earnest heart. It's trying to paint a picture of how God feels about people and how God feels about you. It's a passion, a real drive, a real desire for God. And can I tell you, you ought to have that. Okay, y'all not feeling me on that one. Let, let's switch it up. I, I told you that Hannah fasted or, or she went without eating. Well, think about your diet. Amen. Think about the fact that you can't go a day without wanting to eat. No one has, if you're healthy, no one has to remind you, did you eat today? Did you stop by McDonald's? Are you going by Burger King? Are you cooking the steak tonight? No, there's something within you that just drives you to food. Amen. It's one of the highest desires, natural desires. The next highest desire they say is sex. Amen. And so all of us should have some kind of desire and it is built around earnestness. You see, she prayed earnestly because she had a desire for a child, but she didn't just pray earnestly. She also prayed specifically. Amen. That meant this wasn't some loose goose prayer. It wasn't some throw out, Lord, have mercy. Nothing wrong with that. Lord, go easy on me. Lord, bless me. Lord, show up. But it was very specific. And I want to challenge that sometimes you ought to have a specific prayer. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes when, when you're praying for that book, I mean that brother, you ought to have a specific prayer. You ought to ask for something certain. You ask for, ask for something particular. You ought to ask for something specific. Don't just throw it out. Okay, y'all not feeling me. Let me give you two reasons why you ought to ask for something specific. Because the first is it proves your faith. When you pray specifically and God moves, then it says, wow, God did it. But not only that, it clarifies your heart because it shows what you're really asking for. Okay, I know I'm in the Bible. There, there was a blind beggar, and the blind beggar called out to Jesus, and the crowd said, shut up. It's in Mark. Shut up. Be quiet. We don't want to hear you. Be quiet. Be quiet. But he kept on hollering, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. He was blind. When Jesus got to him, Jesus asked a question. He said, what do you want from me? Now, come on, Jesus. He's blind. Isn't it obvious? No. Jesus wanted him in that occasion to be particular. And every now and then, God wants you to be particular because it will become your testimony. And you will tell somebody, okay, let me testify. I'll give you two instances. Amen. Both of them somehow have to do with a, a, a gold Honda. I remember in college, I had this beat up, in, in seminary, I had this beat up gold Honda. And I just loved going to seminary. It was my focus. I was doing youth ministry. And you had to buy a book. You had to buy books and, and books were pretty expensive. Amen. Pretty expensive. And every now and then I get a couple extra change and teachers in seminary. I don't know that they, 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 they give you so many hundreds of books. They expect you to read the whole library. I, I don't know why, but, but you have to buy. So, so I would get most of my books and then I would, you know, try and get a few here and there. And I remember asking God promise, true story, true story. I said, God, would you bless me? Would you bless me so I could get all the books I need? And I promise you, I went to the library a few days later and there was a white sheet of paper and it said, retiring pastor has a library he wants to give away. I promise you, true story. I drove about an hour away. I believe it was Fredericksburg from Virginia. And I got to this minister's house. He said, hey, young man, you're the first person to respond. Others responded after, but I said I would hold everything for you. Uh, and let me explain before you go in my house. I was a reader and I would give commentary on every book. So I have a whole lot of books when you go into my house. I'm not crazy. I was a reader. And he said, and most of them are signed to this day. I I have books and books and books and books that I didn't pay for. I remember driving away from that man's house and my car was literally sagging in the back because I had loaded the car to the ceiling, the, the driver's seat, the passenger seat, everything I could. I had books everywhere because I was so grateful for what God had done. It was a specific prayer that God answered very specially and specifically. Let me give you one more. I used to pastor in Virginia and I had a faithful member. She was a faithful, hardworking sister. She didn't have a whole lot of money, but she was faithful and hardworking. And I remember her car stopped. She used to serve the church and work faithfully. And I said, Lord, I want to give her a car. You know, I want to give her a car. I want her to have a car. That was my prayer. And I remember I couldn't write a check to buy a car. I wasn't going to buy a check on my credit. So, amen, amen. So I said, Lord, you, you got to show me a way. And I remember that same day I prayed that prayer, I pulled up to one of my favorite trustees' house. Amen. Pulled up to one of my favorite trustees' house. And I was talking to my trustee and I realized they had a gold Honda that was always sitting there. It was just all always sitting there. And out the blue, I said to him, you know what? Uh, that gold Honda, it's been there a long time. They said, that's our daughter, but she's moved away. We have to keep the tires on that thing. We have to get it tuned up. We have to pay fees on it. You know, we really wish we could do something with that car. I said, I know what you can do. I said, sister, promise, true story. Sister so-and-so needs a car. Would you be willing? They said, tell her to call us. They paid for all the tags. They paid for everything. And she drove off in that car. The whole instance took less than a week. You ought to pray some prayer 
prayers specifically. You ought to pray some prayers specifically. You ought to ask God for what you need. You ought to go to God, believe God that he will give it to you. He wants to do it. He can do it. He will do it. The testimony of this church is what God is able to do. He wants to do it. He can do it. And he will do it. Y'all not feeling me say it. He wants to do it. He can do it. And he will do it. Prayed, prayed earnestly, prayed specifically. But then notice she prayed relentlessly. Well, what is that? Mm, I'm glad you asked. Relentlessly means that she didn't just quit. She didn't just stop. She didn't just pause after the first week. But the Bible says year after year. The Bible says that she got older, she prayed harder year after year. She didn't quit. She kept praying. She kept believing that God still answers prayer. I don't know who this is for, but I'm bothering you. I don't know who this is for, but I'm poking you on the shoulder. I don't know who this is for, but I'm getting in your face. Mm, yeah. And I'm letting you know, don't stop praying. It might be a child. It might be finances. It might be health. It might be your hope. It might be a mental good. I don't care what it is. Don't stop praying. Keep asking God relentlessly. I know in the Bible. The Bible gives a strange picture of relentless prayer. It's a picture of a judge. The Bible says he was an ungodly judge. The Bible says he was an unfair judge. And a woman went to him about her son. She went to the judge. The judge said, leave me alone. But she kept going to the judge. She found his cell phone. She called him. She knocked on his home address. She sent him letters in the mail. She kept on going. She showed up in the courtroom. She was always there. And finally the judge says, you are a nag. You are a bugaboo. You are harassing me. You know, I can get a, 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 a restraining order against you. Leave me alone. He said, but you know what? Because you keep bothering me, I'm just going to go ahead and give you what you want. Take it and get out of my courtroom. Well, in a different sense, God is much gracious. God is much more kind. God is much more loving. But he said, be relentless. Keep on asking me. Keep on pushing the door. Keep on knocking. Keep on believing. It might be 10 years. It might be 20 years. It might be 30 years. It might be 40 years. You keep on asking God and see what God can do. Because some prayers take time. Some prayers are wine prayers. I know we got a lot of beer prayers. Uh, I don't drink either. I know we got a lot of beer prayers, but some prayers are fine prayers. Some prayers are wine prayers. You just got to keep on praying. And the longer the wine has been there, the better the wine is. Yeah, that's right. Right? The better the wine tastes, that's what they say. The better the wine, the more valuable the wine is because it's a wine prayer. Okay, I'm going to move on now. E.K. Bailey tells a story as I get ready to take my seat. It's the story of a farmer. The story says that, that, that this farmer had land, but he needed some water. So he called a man to dig a well. E.K. Bailey, Bailey tells a story why he's literally dying of cancer. He has a brain tumor, and it's only a matter of time. But he tells the story like this. This is what they say. E.K. Bailey said, he said, the the farmer calls the, the well digger and says, come to my property and dig a well. And so the man drills and he doesn't drill very long because after about a nine feet he hits water. And so finally uh, the, the, the farmer says, wow, that's great. Uh, but then he says, before you go, I, I know it's not going to cost me a lot but I just got to ask a question. Will this well sustain me? He said, oh not really, sir. I mean, you got water but it won't last long because if there's ever a dry spell, you, you got to go a little deeper. So he says, well, go deeper. He said, if I go deeper, it's going to cost you something. If I go deeper, it's going to be expensive. If I go deeper, there's a price to pay. If I go deeper, there's a burden you got to share. He said, I still want you to go deeper. Drill deeper. He went 30 feet. Drill deeper. He went 40 feet. Drill deeper. He went 50 feet. And he says, sir, what you're getting ready to do, you're getting ready to hit the underwater stream. This means no matter what's happening up here, there'll always be water down there. You want me to go that deep? He said, go that deep. But I got to tell you it's gonna cost he says that's okay I'll pay the price keep on drilling I can take it I'll pay it keep on drilling and there's some people who have the kind of prayer life where they've been drilling for a while they've said to God it hurts but keep on drilling I want what you got keep on drilling I'm willing to pay the price keep on drilling it's not gonna be easy keep on drilling it breaks my heart keep on drilling I got a passion for souls keep on drilling I see it coming keep on drilling keep on drilling God says if you want it, you gotta pray. You gotta be passionate about it. You gotta be earnest about it. You gotta turn down your plate. You, you gotta push back from your desires. It'll take some agony, but God is blessing you. God is doing something with you because He's going deeper in your life. And there's nothing like being deep in God. Hallelujah! And praise God. I thank God for Jesus because He's the testimony of somebody who was willing to go through agony for something valuable. The cross is a picture of going deeper. The cross is a picture 
Each time he suffered, he was saying, go deeper. Each time they pierced him, he was saying, go deeper to salvation. Go deeper to justification. Go deeper for my people. Go deeper. The gospel has been preached. We're standing to our feet. I didn't give you my last point. The last point was the idea that Hannah promised God. She said, God, when you give me a son specifically, I'll turn him over to the priest. And there's a wonderful hmm, or a difficult picture because there are children who seemingly were wayward and wasted. And then Samuel comes into the same home, but he's not wayward or wasted. He's a worshiper who's listening for the voice of the Lord. So the lesson is this. First, if you ever promise God something, keep your promise. You remember, God, if you give me this man, I'll treat him so good. God, if you give me this job, I'll always be on time. God, if you give me health, I'll be committed to you. God, if you get me out of this jail cell, I'll never do it again. Keep your promise. But then there's a, another lesson there. That the blessing from burdens is somehow always sweeter. The blessing from burdens are somehow always sweeter. For the person who's going through, I want to encourage you that God is up to something. God is not sadistic. I use that word deliberately. He is not wasting your burden. Wait, wait, wait. You're not listening. I see a few of you. I, need, this is something I really want to get this in your spirit. God knows what he's doing. There's a reason he did it. It hurts you, but he has a plan for it. He's going to bless you through it. Believe God. Believe God for it. And thank him. He's drilling deeper. The doors of the church are open. Amen. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, let me challenge you. Let me bother you. Let me speak to you. Let me call on you in particular. That God has a plan for your life. But God will not force. God will not force you. He'll give you every reason to love him. But he will not force you. He's calling you to respond to him with an openness and a willingness. So first, for salvation. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, now I know we're getting ready to go. We're excited about the day. But please, let me get your attention. If you're not absolutely sure of where you stand with God, be sure today. Be sure today. Be sure today. You don't want to uh, sign off on this document without reading it carefully. Are you sure? Are you confident? Are you absolute about your relationship with Jesus Christ? If you are not, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Someone will meet you. Someone will walk with you. Just raise your hand where you are. Come on, just raise your hand where you are. Someone will meet you. If you're uncertain, if you're unaware, if you're not confident about where you stand with